Good afternoon, y'all, uh, and welcome to today's Texas Science Festival session entitled Saving the Bees with Felicity Muth and Nancy Moran. We're so very glad that you've decided to join us and that you're interested in today's topic. By way of introduction, uh, my name is Patrick Newman. I'm the executive director of the university's Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, and I'm privileged and pleased to be today's moderator. A couple of housekeeping notes um, for each of you to be aware of. Um, please note that all participants will be muted and without video for the duration of the webinar. Because this is one of our Science Sparks events, each speaker will talk for about 10 minutes and then we'll move to a Q&A format. Please use the Q&A feature by hovering over the bottom center of your screen at any time to submit questions you would like our speakers to answer. If you submitted questions in advance uh, of today's presentations, rest assured we have those and we'll do our very best um, to get through those, as I said, as best we can. I would like now to introduce uh, our first speaker, Felicity Muth, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Integrative Biology. A former L'Oreal for Women in Science fellow, Felicity is also an expert in science communication as she wrote for Scientific American Magazine online for a number of years and has also been featured on NPR's Science Friday. Felicity, time is yours. Great, thank you. Okay, thanks for coming to my talk today. I'm gonna be talking about how behavior and cognition can tell us about bees and how to, um, how to help them out. Okay, so my lab at UT Austin, broadly speaking, works on bees and bee cognition. And cognition, whether it's in humans, bees, or any other animal, is how animals perceive their worlds how they process that information and how they make decisions based on that information. And when I tell people that I work on bee cognition, I tend to get one of two questions. The first is, why would you use a bee to study cognition? And the second is, why are all the bees dying? And today I'm hopefully gonna answer or start to answer both of those questions through giving a little taster of some of the things going on in my lab. Before we get going, I'm gonna ask you just to think of a bee. And there's a good chance that you will think of a bee that looks like this. So this is our domesticated honeybee that is really critical in pollinating our food, but it is not native to the States. It was brought over by European colonists. And here in the US, we have 4,000 species of native bee. And one of those groups are bumblebees, and this is the group that I work on. So most often I work with this bumblebee, the common Eastern bumblebee. And uh, this bumblebee we use in America for pollinating a wide variety of, of crops, but they're also really important for native wildflowers. But the bumblebee you're probably more used to seeing out and about in Austin is this American bumblebee that is pretty common around here. Okay, so why would I use a bumblebee to study cognition? Well, bumblebees are generalists, which means that they can visit a wide variety of flowers. And these flowers vary in, in how they look and how they smell, but also in the rewards they offer to bees. And so from a bee's perspective, it makes sense really that it should be able to learn which of these flowers has got the best rewards in it. And it also makes sense from the flower's perspective because of course, flowers rely on bees for pollination. And so the, the wonderful colors and smells of flowers, not only there to attract bees to them, but also to make them easier for bees to learn about and more memorable to bees. Okay, and so when a bee comes into a meadow like this, it's faced with this informationally rich environment that has to make all these decisions about choosing between all these different flowers and, and an individual bee can visit hundreds to thousands of flowers a day. And so you can see the, how all these decisions would, would build up over time. And when a bee lands on a flower, we know that it can learn so much about that flower. It can learn about the smell of the flower, visual cues like the color, the pattern, the shape of the flower, temperature, the texture, and it can even learn about the electric field around a flower. And the bees are really good at learning, but they also have a bunch of really complex behavior. 
And you might have seen some headlines in recent years that look like this. And in reality, it feels like a year can't go by before we discover another complex behavior in, in bumblebees. And so in my lab, we're really excited by this. We think it's super interesting, but the part that, that gets us most excited is getting at the cognitive underpinnings to these behaviors. Because some behaviors can seem really complex, but actually have really simple cognitive underpinnings. And so for example, I've got a postdoc in my lab right now, Caroline Strang, who is working on um, emotions in bumblebees. And so what is an emotion in a bumblebee? Well, specifically, she's looking at something that's called cognitive bias, which is, colloquially speaking, kind of optimism and pessimism. And so how do you measure that in an animal? Well, an animal learns that a particular stimulus is good, another one is bad, and then you give it an ambiguous stimulus between these two, and if the animal's behaving optimistically, it'll treat it like it's good, and if it's behaving pessimistically, it'll treat it like it's bad. And this basic paradigm is used in animal welfare a lot to see how an animal's conditions affect its mood. And uh, this is something that was first demonstrated in a rat and has been shown in a bunch of other animals since then, including bees. And something we're doing right now is trying to understand what is going on cognitively when a bee behaves optimistically or pessimistically, but the idea being that if we can work out what's going on in a bee, it might help us better understand what's going on in these other animals too. Okay, so like I said, bees are really good at learning all these different associations. They have some pretty cool complex behavior, but basically everything we know about this comes from them uh, learning about and interacting with nectar on flowers. But flowers don't just reward bees with nectar, they also use other rewards, and a really common one is pollen. And so there are flowers, uh, like these ones on the left here, that do just reward bees with nectar. But these flowers, like I'm sure you will recognize our Texas blue bonnet, um, and these are some tomato flowers, they only have pollen on them for bees. And an individual bumblebee will collect both nectar and pollen while out foraging from a single flower. And so a question that I asked a few years ago now was whether bees can learn about pollen. And so how do you train a bee? Well, we take an individual, we stick a little number on its back to keep track of it, and we can present her with options. So for example, artificial flowers that are one color that are rewarding and another color that aren't rewarding. And so this is what one of our artificial flowers looks like. Um, you can see we've got some pretty, pretty fancy methods here in animal behavior. This is a bee collecting cherry pollen off of a pipe cleaner on a colored card. And here is a video of a bee being trained. So this is slowed down, obviously, so you can see her flying. And she's flying between these blue flowers, which don't have any pollen on them. But the yellow flowers do. When she finds that pollen on a yellow flower, she stops to collect it. And by giving her experience like this, we can train her um, to, that the yellow flowers have pollen. And the way that we can be sure that she has learned is we then do a test where there is no pollen on any of the flowers. I'm gonna show you a video now of what that looks like. So here is a bee that was trained where yellow flowers had pollen. And you should be able to see that she's searching on these yellow flowers now for pollen, even though there's no pollen on any of these flowers. And so um, from this basic finding that bees can learn about pollen, I then went on to show that they can remember this long term, they can learn about nectar and pollen at the same time, but just like with us, there's a cost to learning about more than one thing at the same time. It can, it can be harder to multitask. And so this finding was fairly exciting to me because it both tells us more about bees and their interaction with flowers, because it means that when a bee comes into a meadow like this, he is making decisions of which flowers to visit based not only on where she found nectar in the past, but also on where she found pollen. But we also are using this as a model to more un broadly understand how animals learn and make decisions when there's more than one reward at once. Okay, so I've given you a little taste of why we might use bees to study cognition, and I'm gonna briefly talk about some work that's related to bee decline. So bees live in these environments that we are changing. 
So um, bees, broadly, not every single species, but the, many of them are in decline right now. And there are many stresses affecting bees. Two of the big ones are habitat loss, because you know, if we take away the flowers that bees get food from, of course, they're not gonna do as well. And then the other one is use of pesticides. And there's one particular group of pesticides that I've worked a lot with, neonicotinoid pesticides. So these pesticides, they're banned in the EU, but they're still the most commonly used pesticide in the US. And so if you go into a supermarket, just about anything you buy will have been treated with a neonic at some point. And we know that neonics have negative effects on bumblebees. They negatively affect colony growth, which may in part be to um, impairing their ability to forage efficiently. And some of my previous work has shown that it impairs bees' ability to learn about floral scents. And so this could be driving this effect on their ability to forage efficiently, which then in turn might have cascading effects on the colony growth. Um, and so what about the replacements? Well, my postdoc, Harry Civita, um, recently did a meta-analysis showing that these replacement pesticides, which are now being used in the EU um, in place of the neonics, are actually also not good for bees. And so clearly there is something wrong with the regulatory process. And part of the problem is, is new pesticides tend to only be tested on honeybees, not all these other bees. And often they only look at lethality rather than other measures. And like I've shown you, bees have got all these complex behaviors. Um, and if these get messed up, it can really affect their ability to function. And so Harry wrote this up as an opinion piece recently that was published in The Hill. Um, but to end on a lighter note, um, we now have a new collaboration going with uh, Shalini Jha, who's an associate professor in biology. And we're trying to look at pesticides in the environment and not only how they're getting into honeybees, but how they're getting into all potentially our native bees in Texas. So you might recognize some of these bees. I've found all of these bees in my backyard here in Austin. And we're interested in whether pesticides are getting into these bees, and if so, the variables that might affect different species. And I just wanted to give a particular shout out to this bee here, our longhorn bee, that where the males have these beautiful long antennae, um, and uh, I think personally might be a great new mascot for, for UT Austin. So I just wanna finish by uh, thanking my lab, my collaborators, my funding. And if you're interested to read more about my research, please uh, check out my website. And I'll be really happy to take some questions now. Thank you. Felicity, thank you. That was um, super interesting um, and, and very, very informative. So thank you. Um, we have a few questions from um, our audience. And so let's see if we can't tackle a few of those in the next few minutes. The first one, um, I promise you, this is not from me. Um, this is from one of our attendees, um, but it's a really good one. The question is, uh, is there a good list of bee-friendly native plants that you can recommend? <laughs> Yeah, it does seem like this was planted and I promised that it wasn't. So I actually anticipated this question being a popular one. And so one of the most important things you can do as an individual is to plant native flowers. And the Wildflower Center is obviously a really good place to learn more about natives here in, in Texas. Natural Garden is also a great place to get native plants. Um, for me, as somebody who's kind of a lazy gardener, it's actually the best thing you can do for bees, is leaving a lot of native um, habitat around because a lot of bees nest in the ground. And so having space that doesn't have a lawn, doesn't have any you know, pebbles or concrete is really necessary for bees to be able to, to survive. And then finally, perhaps an obvious one, but these neonics that I mentioned that we know are bad for bees are actually sold here in Home Depot. And so avoiding using those is really critical. Great, thank you. Um, and thanks for the plug for the Wildflower Center. Um, I'll, I'll, I promise that I'll, I'll compensate you later for that. Um, <laughs> next question, um, how are bees in Texas changing? So that's a really good question. Um, so I guess the answer is probably not that satisfying in that there just isn't a lot of data on all the other species. And so in the last kind of five years or so, 
Um, there's been more attention from scientists in terms of getting funding to look at all these species. But like I said, we have 4,000 native species in North America and you know, fewer than that in Texas, but we just don't have solid data. And I mean, I talked to, we have a, a bee expert, um, Jack Neff here in Texas. And from talking to him, he can say as somebody who pays a lot of attention to bees, that he has personally seen a dramatic decrease in the species he's seen around as, as um, you know, with increasing urbanization and land use change to more agricultural land as you might expect. Um, but it's not something that has been um, quantified in the way that we would like. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, next couple, um, I'm, I'm gonna combine a couple of these questions uh, because they're very similar. It, it, questions about bees and seeing color. So um, do bees see color or do they see, um, you know, broader than the visible light spectrum? Maybe explain a little bit how, how bees see color. Yeah, so the first experiment demonstrating that bees do have color vision, or specifically honeybees, was actually done about a century ago. And uh, Carl von Frisch, who did the experiment, won the Nobel Prize in part for that work. Um, and so, yup, they definitely do see color. Um, their vision is different to ours. They can see in the UV range of, um, of the light spectrum. And so there were all kinds of things out there that they're seeing on flowers that we're not. And so as experimenters, of course, you know, we have to be careful about um, trying to see things through their perspective. And the way that we do that is we use something called a spectrophotometer that we can use to measure the reflectance of light on different surfaces. And then usefully, another researcher has looked at the spectral sensitivity of the photoreceptors inside bees. So basically, um, we know what their eyes, the bumblebees, are sensitive to. And so then I can take my measures color that I see, run them through a program, and then the program can tell me how discriminable those colors are to a bee, which is really helpful. So I've worked with colors, for example, that to me, I can't tell the difference between, but I know that my bee can tell the difference. Very interesting. I know, um, you know, as a, as a plant person, um, it's kind of fun to see the plants that, that I know and love through the eyes of bees, right? And, and there's lots of, um, just a quick online search will, will bring up sort of common flowers that are viewed through the UV spectrum and it, um, it's a whole other set of, of flowers. It's kind of fun to see the plants that we know and love as our, our bees see them too. Um, a couple of uh, great questions um, still ahead. So let me um, dive right back into the, the questions. Um, are bees allergic to anything? <laughs> Good. I am not the person to ask about that. Um, yeah, I'm afraid pass. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll move on to the next one. Um, this one is uh, a little bit more specific to your research. So um, if the bees don't find a yellow flower, will they go back to looking at the blue flowers? Um, and how long does that process take? Yeah, so bumblebees, um, you know, when I say bees, I tend to mean bumblebees because they're the ones that I work with. Bumblebees are extremely flexible. Um, so they, if, if they don't find reward on, on the color they're looking on, they very quickly switch to another and they can very readily learn and unlearn things. Great. Um, any, we've talked a little bit about um, pesticides and their, um, the harm that they pose to bees, native bees, bumblebees, honeybees. Any recommendations for um, pesticides for homeowners? Oh God, so I would suggest going to the websites that I linked before, um, chatting to people at the Wildflower Center. Um, there's also Xerces, so uh, X-E-R-C-E-S, which has a ton of useful resources. Um, personally, I, I garden and I grow food here in Texas and I've been fine doing alternative strategies that are specific to each um, thing that I'm growing without using any pesticides. And that's with a lot of insect pests here in Texas. And so it's definitely doable. Absolutely. Um, you know, we at the Wildflower Center, we practice integrated pest management. And so pesticide is the last thing that we want to apply. And there's lots of other things that we can do to help out and lots of good information on the, the, the resources that you've already listed. Um, let's talk for a second about bee hotels. Um, are bee hotels of benefit to native bees in the Austin area? 
Yeah, so the, the bee hotels are specifically for these bees, uh, Osmia. And the idea, these are bees that nest inside uh, kind of stems of wood. And so you can buy these uh, hotels that are basically often like little stems that then they will nest in. Um, I think that overall, these are really a nice thing and, and, and a thing that then you can, you know, see the bees in your backyard and often get kids involved. Um, there is some evidence that maybe bees can spread disease between each other more easily when they're in the bee hotels. So just like how when we live in apartment blocks, we're more likely to catch colds from each other than when we live out in the country. By putting all the bees together, you know, there might be a, a, a slight effect. That, but I think that overall, it's a nice thing in order to see, you know, what bees are doing. Um, a really simple way of just making your own is you can just take a drill and, and bits of different sizes and drill into a dead piece of wood in your, in your backyard. And by doing lots of different sized holes, um, you can get different bees because obviously different species are different sizes and then have different size holes that they prefer to nest in. Great feedback. Thank you. Um, here's one that seems appropriate in the year of murder hornets. Um, how can I identify bad or scary bees from the friendly ones that live in the friendly state? So there are, in Texas, we don't have any <laughs> we don't have any bad or scary bees, but there are no murder hornets here, which aren't bees anyway. But um, yeah, I had actually a guy come to my office with what he said he thought was a murder hornet in a, in a tube that he had caught in his car. And I like, I appreciate people, you know, noticing things in their environment. And I'm always happy to look at insights people have caught, but it definitely wasn't a murder hornet. It was one of our native wasps. And we have some beautiful giant native wasps here in Texas. And most of them, slash all of them, will just leave you alone, you know, if, if you don't bother them. And so, yeah, I, I, I would say, yeah, no, no scary bees here. <laughs> Only good bees in the friendly state. So um, uh, uh, let's see if we can't get a couple more questions in um, and ones that are sort of specific to your area of research. Um, you mentioned um, in one of your slides that bees have the ability to detect electrical fields. Um, can you speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, so that was an experiment from a group in the UK where um, they manipulated electrical fields around artificial flowers and showed that bees could pay attention to them and actually learn which flowers were rewarding based on the electrical fields. And so the reason that they can do this is thought to be because, I mean, flowers and bees have weak charges and they're in the opposite direction. And it's thought that maybe this is the case in part so that when a bee lands on a flower, the, the dusty pollen that is charged will move more easily to the bee. Perfect, thank you. Let's, um, let's see if we can squeeze one more question in here, maybe two more. Um, and let's, these ones are, are both aimed at, at bee emotions. So um, do pesticides have any impact on bee emotions? We have no idea. So, I mean, there have only been two studies done on, on this that I, that I mentioned earlier, and, and we are doing an experiment right now. Um, but I think that's a really good question. Um, you know, we know that these neonics affect all kinds of aspects of their behavior. And, and given that we do have this paradigm where we can look at, um, you know, how they respond to these novel stimuli that they're not sure if they're good or bad, I think that that would be, yeah, a really interesting experiment to do. Excellent. Um, maybe just in closing, um, if you wouldn't mind sort of just re-explaining in, in um, terms that the moderator can understand um, emotions and particularly optimism and, and how bees experience that. Yeah, and so I think that first of all, we have to be really careful, right, how we use these terms um, because they are very human laden terms. And often what we do is we'll take a term like emotions and we define it in science under very narrow um, criteria when we're trying to look at it in non-human animals. And of course we have to look at it in non-human animals at all, but that's obviously not to say that, you know, an emotion in a bee is anyway an equivalent to an emotion in a human. But um, this behavior that we see, this um, response to an ambiguous novel stimuli in terms of when, a, when an animal um, is having a good experience is more likely to see it as a good thing and when an animal is having a bad experience is more likely to see it as a bad thing. This is a behavioral phenomenon that we see across 
a bunch of different vertebrates and now this invertebrate as well. And so it could be that this is a, a common behavior with a common underpinning, or it could have a different underpinning in all these different cases. Um, and that is something that we are that we're interested in. Very cool. This is um, this has been very very interesting. So thank you so much, Felicity. Admittedly, you had me at your first mention of wildflower, um, and and you had me hooked from then on. So we really appreciate um, your time and your perspective today. Our next speaker um, is Nancy Moran, who is the Warren J. and Viola May Raymer Chair in Integrative Biology. She's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the winner of a McCarthy Fellowship and the International Prize for Biology. Nancy, I'll turn the time over to you. Oh, great, so can everyone hear me? Is everything good? Um, Thank you all for coming today. I'm gonna to talk about, about honeybees, that um, dreaded bee that Felicity mentioned. That's not your typical bee. And I'm gonna talk about an unusual part of it, the gut microbiome. So bacteria that live in the gut, just like humans, um, honeybees and bumblebees have a gut microbiome that's very important to their health. First, I'll just give a little background on, um, let me get this working. Sorry, I'm just, okay. It's going slow. Okay. A little background on um, honeybee, and Felicity introduced you a little bit, but so this is really the pinnacle of social evolution. Honeybees have large colonies, complex social behavior. There's a queen and up to 50,000 workers living in a colony, and it's very complex and sophisticated social behaviors. So they've been studied by a lot of famous biologists, and we know a lot about them. They're not native to the US. They were de domesticated about 3,000 years ago in Northern Africa and the Middle East for honey and wax, some of the useful products that humans wanted from bees. But they've been spread worldwide by humans. And we need honeybees. They're, they're not necessarily good for local ecosystems because they do compete with native bees. For example, many entomologists refer to honeybees as pollen pigs because they, are, um, they do use a lot of pollen resources. But we need them. We need them for crop pollination. And they're worth billions of dollars a year in the US economy in agriculture. And they're important, certain foods would be much more difficult to produce without them. So unfortunately, um, they've been undergoing um, very high mortality of colonies in the past, approximately since 2007, um, there was increased mortality and that's been ongoing. So some kind of factor has changed in the environment that's causing them to die more. And it's not really clear what it is. It seems to be multiple factors. And so we need to know more about what are these factors? Can we modify them? Can we prevent the greater death of bees? And I've been particularly interested in using the gut microbiomes of bees and understanding them. And potentially they could be a key to improving bee health. And another reason um, that we study the gut microbiome in my lab is that it's actually got a lot of parallels as a model for other gut microbiomes, including that of humans. There's actually a lot of similarities between the honeybee microbiome and that of humans. In both cases, there's a very specialized bacterial community. So bacteria that live only in that particular host, only in the honeybee, or in the case of humans, only in humans. Most of our gut bacteria do not live anywhere else. And the same is true for honeybees. So we don't get our gut bacteria from our yogurt or our food or our refrigerator. We get them from each other. And the same is true of honeybees. They go from directly from one host to the other. And so when a honeybee emerges in the hive as a young honeybee, it immediately starts to interact with the other workers, its sisters in the hive, and it acquires through an oral route through the mouth, um, these bacteria that then colonize the gut at very large numbers. And so this is also true of humans. It's how we get our gut bacteria. And just as in humans, honey, honeybees rely on their gut microbiota for health. So basically, um, many aspects of the development um, and health of the honeybee are dependent on the gut microbiota. And this is actually what my lab has been studying for about the last 10 years, just how the gut microbiota affects um, the health of the host. And there's actually, again, a lot of parallels to what happens in the human system. For example, honeybees help to digest the fiber in the pollen cell walls, just as our gut bacteria help to digest plant fiber. They neutralize toxins in the diet. They promote weight gain and, um, and affect the endocrine system. 
They stimulate the immune system. And probably the best documented is that they protect against all kinds of pathogens that enter through the gut. So viruses, bacteria, fungi, the gut bacteria are important in protecting bees against these pathogens. So one thing that differs between honeybees and people is that honeybees have a relatively simple gut microbiota. So only about five bacterial species make up over 95% of the bacteria in the gut. So here on the left, there's a honeybee and its gut has been pulled out. So here's its little stinger and here's its gut. And so it has different sections, the mid gut, the hind gut, and almost all the bacteria live in the hind gut. Again, very parallel to humans. Almost all of our bacteria live in the distal part of the gut. And there's different sections and different bacteria live in these different sections. So there's this ileum and rectum and different ones of these species colonize the different parts. And these are cross sections, sort of cartoons of a cross section of the ileum that has all these folds and the rectum with different specialized bacteria in them. And in humans, in contrast, there are hundreds of bacteria in each person's gut. So it's much more difficult to study. It's a very complex system. So the honeybee provides a relatively simple system for studying these microbiome in the gut. This is a um, micrograph, so a micros microscopy image of the cross section of the ileum. So the green are the, are the cells of the bee and the blue is the nuclei of the bee cells. And then these um, through molecular probes, we can, we can color the different bacteria in different ways. So one of them is S. alvi. That's a very important bacterium in the bee gut. It colonizes the wall, very intimate association with the bee cells. And then this G. apicola forms these little nodules of cells that are sort of sprinkled around like that. So they have these very special spatial arrangements and it represents a long evolutionary history with bees. So just a couple of questions that I'll talk about today that we've addressed. Um, first of all, are honeybee declines linked to disrupted microbiomes? And if so, what factors cause this imbalance and can we avoid them? Okay, so why are we getting honeybee declines? Is it partly is part of the key, the gut microbiome. And then second, can we alter the microbiome to improve honeybee health? Can we make honeybees and honeybee colonies um, more robust by changing the microbiomes, by helping the microbiomes? So one question we've looked at for this first part is do pesticides harm bees by disrupting their microbiome? And in particular, one of the ones we've looked at is glyphosate. You might've heard of this, it's a herbicide, it's the most used agrochemical in the world. Here's a picture of it here on the right. Um, and so it's, it's been increasingly used in agriculture and it's also used um, in, in all kinds of situations along roads and so on. And this is partly, this is largely due to the increased use of genetically modified plants that are resistant to herbicides. So there's been a lot more use of it. Potentially, this is one of the factors affecting bees and bee health over the last um, 15 years. And we know a lot about how glyphosate works and what we know tells us that it, actually we have every reason to expect that it would affect the microbiome. So the target of glyphosate is this enzyme, this is the abbreviation, it's got a very long name, um, the EPSPS enzyme. And it's an enzyme in this pathway that produces essential amino acids, amino acids that all organisms need to make protein. So most organisms have this pathway and glyphosate basically blocks one of the enzymes that this EPSPS enzyme in this pathway. So organisms that depend on this pathway will be susceptible to glyphosate. So who is susceptible to glyphosate? Well, it turns out animals are glyphosate tolerant because animals such as ourselves and such as honeybees don't have EPSPS. We get our essential amino acids from our food. We don't make it ourselves. We don't have that enzyme. We're not directly affected, but we could be affected if the microbiome is affected, right? So, so that's what we wanted to look at. Whereas plants and most bacteria are glyphosate sensitive. They have this enzyme. So plants are sensitive. That's why it's an herbicide. It kills plants, but also most bacteria are sensitive. In the case of the B beneficial um, gut bacteria, most of them, four of the five, are susceptible to glyphosate in the lab in lab culture. And we wanted to address whether or not um, they're actually susceptible, whether or not this is really happening to bees in hives. Does it increase, does it disrupt the microbiome? And does that have an effect on bee survivorship? And this work was led by a graduate student, a really um, great graduate student, Eric Mota, um, who um, did his dissertation on the effects of glyphosate on the bee microbiome. And so we've done a lot of different experiments that I don't have time to, I'll describe them all in detail, but just to say that some of them are 
um, in actual hives that are outdoors. So we have hives on the roof of a building at UT Austin. We also have a lot of hives outside of Austin um, in the, on, a, on a private land on ranches. And we also um, do experiments under lab conditions when we want to have more control and look at specific things. In the hive, we sometimes do these mark recapture experiments where we can mark bees that are treated in different ways with different colors, look at their survivorship. Here we see Dr. Casey Raymond, a postdoctoral researcher, uh, marking bees with different colors before returning them to the hive. So we've done a number of different kinds of experiments to look at this. And the big conclusion we find is that indeed, at least at some reasonable, reasonably realistic concentrations, glyphosate can disrupt the bee microbiome and can increase bee mortality. So we, here's just some examples of the data. We, can, we see that it reduces the numbers of beneficial gut bacteria. It can make bees more vulnerable to common pathogens. So um, in the presence of a pathogen, bees exposed to glyphosate die at higher rates. These are just their survivorship over time, the number of bees that survive. And if we look at um, survivorship actually in hives outdoors, we see that bees exposed to increasing concentrations of glyphosate have higher and higher mortality rates. So depending on the concentration, but even at somewhat low concentrations, there are increases in mortality of bees that are exposed to glyphosate. So on the second question, uh, so we know a little more, to wrap that up, we know a little more about what affects them. It might be able to inform some of the practices. For example, we shouldn't spray flowering fields that have bees on them. We should try to reduce exposure to glyphosate. Another question is, can we change the gut microbiome to protect honeybees? And honeybees have a lot of problems, not just glyphosate, many others. And among them are natural enemies. And you may see this beautiful bee here, but what is this lump on it right there? That horrible thing is a varroa mite, a uh, mite that um, got introduced from Asia, um, switched hosts, and now is a, one of the biggest um, pests on honeybees. And actually, varroa mites interact with viruses because when they bite the bee, they suck its blood, but they also introduce viruses such as this one, the deformed wing virus, which is an RNA virus, something that everyone nowadays knows much more about than they did a year ago. RNA viruses infect almost everything, including bees, and bees have a number of them, and this is just one of them. So we wanted to see if we could alter the gut microbiome to protect bees against these natural enemies. And in fact, we found out that we can. And so this is work done really with a whole team of people at UT Austin. It was really led by Sean Leonard, a, a graduate student, but also Jeff Barrick, a professor in molecular biosciences. Several um, undergrads were important participants contributing to this. So we found that bee gut symbionts can be modified to act as vaccines that activate the, the bee's own immune defenses against these deadly viruses and varroa mites. And so it actually turns out this works at least in the lab. So, so far we've only done it in the lab, but we can, with the modified gut symbionts colonizing a bee, we could increase the mite mortality by 100%, we could double it. And we could, in, and in the case of the virus, we could um, give a 50% higher survival of bees that were exposed to the virus. So we can have very positive results from this and we hope that sometime it might be used in the field. And this is just, just a scenario of how it might be used outdoors. So here's a bee, we imagine that we could introduce these engineered bacteria in a hive feeder and the bee would eat them. It would, the bacteria would colonize the bee gut. We know that that works well. The bacteria then produce these specific RNA molecules that cross the gut wall of the bee. And we know that that happens from the lab work. And then the bee's own immune system, which is called the RNA interference system. So look that up on, on Wikipedia if you wanna understand how that works. Um, it's triggered by these very targeted specific RNA molecules that target that specific pest. So we can target a given virus, a given mite, and then the result is the infection is blocked. And so this is potentially a tool that could be used to help bees. So just in summary, um, honeybees, just like people, need a healthy gut microbiome. And when it's disrupted, um, the bees are unhealthy and the colonies are unhealthy as well. And we can learn more about protecting bee microbiomes. That's what my lab's been working to do for the last decade or so. Also just to understand how they work on a fundamental level. And we might find ways to bolster the microbiome to improve bee health. And just at the end, just wanna comment um, or thank all the people in the lab and the different funding sources. So this is the result of a lot of different kinds of work um, and with different sub questions and a lot of different people have contributed to it over the years. So with that, um, 
thank you. I, I hope that there's time for questions. Nancy, thank you um, so very much. That was very interesting, very enlightening, um, and not something that I think I would have said in relation to bee guts prior to your presentation, but now I, um, I find them very interesting. A um, couple of, we do have time for a couple of questions and there are some good ones in here. So um, let's jump right into them. Uh, besides internal factors such as gut bacteria, can external factors such as climate change be affecting the bee population? Yes, well, certainly climate change, um, because so bees need flowers. Um, you know, bees will not do well when they don't have flowers to forage yet. Climate change affects flowers and their abundance and, and you know, whether they bloom or not. So if you have a, um, a change with a dry year and, and, and extreme conditions, you're going to have less flowers and that hurts bees. So first of all, that is the key to bee life is flowers. Um, and Felicity's talk also showed that. So that's probably the biggest impact. Um, bees are actually directly affected by weather themselves, um, but they're, you know, honeybees in particular are actually very resilient because they can go back to their hive and only go out when it's, when um, conditions are okay for foraging. So um, extremely cold winters can kill bees. We have yet to see if our Texas storm has we, we're not quite sure what it did to all of our bees. Um, we're a little bit sad that it might have killed off some of our colonies because it was extreme. But in general, many honeybee colonies can persist through very cold periods. So that, you know, that's not necessarily going to be uh, a devastating thing. There's a question um, from a beekeeper. Um, and the, the question is, should beekeepers feed their bees specialized probiotic products? They Beekeepers are inundated with offers and suggestions to do that, should they do that? Yeah, so we're actually interested in that. I told you about these engineered bacteria and that's kind of far off in the future because there's a lot of regulatory things that would have to be looked into before those are used. But we've also looked into um, natural probiotics and, and I know quite a bit about the products that are out there. And um, many of them actually don't consist of bacteria that naturally live in bees, right? Um, and in fact, there's one study of some of those that actually shows it hurts bees. Like, you know, if you just eat random bacteria that came from some other source, it might not be good for you. <laughs> you know, it's not really necessarily a good thing. So, um, so something that's a probiotic, say in humans, it may not be a good thing for bees and vice versa. They're very different from humans. And so I generally am somewhat skeptical of them, but I, you know, I, I don't, none of them are um, really shown in, you know, with, real rigor to be effective. I, I would say the ones that are on the market and we've gotten interested in actually, I don't wanna promote anything we're doing because we have no money involved in this, but we're interested in the idea that um, the natural gut bacteria from bees could be used as a, as a way of kind of reconstituting their gut microbiota when it is disrupted by various um, factors in the environment. So most of the bacteria that are out there, well, none of them are the actual natural bacteria that live naturally in bees. Um, so, so potentially, you know, there is some potential that, that something could work, but I'm not sure the things that are out there now, um, I, I would be a little bit skeptical personally, but, you know, who knows, you know, some, some beekeepers think they work and possibly they do, I'm not sure. Great, thank you. Um, perhaps one last question. Um, that again, sort of geared towards beekeepers, but that frankly could apply to all of us. Uh, what can we do to bolster microbiomes in honeybee hives? Well, you know, avoiding, so one thing that many beekeepers do is they put antibiotics directly in the hive and it's for one particular bee pathogen, the foul brood pathogen. Well, if you do that, you are disrupting the microbiome. We did other work, you know, it's not unexpected because it's an antibiotic, it kills bacteria. So it, it actually can increase mortality of adult workers um, because of the disruption of the microbiome. So avoiding putting antibiotics into beehives, which is a very common thing in the US, it's generally banned in Europe, um, is one thing. Um, of, you know, making sure they have access to forage that is that doesn't have pesticides on it is, is the other thing, um, basically that, you know, bees, Bees need flowers and they need flowers that don't have poisons on them that you know, will make them sick. And, and one thing we found out that includes glyphosate. So you don't wanna be spraying plants that are in flower where bees are, you know, because that'll be a very high concentration that, that would be disruptive to the bee. So at least avoiding spraying right around beehives and things like that um, for sure. Great, thank you so much. Um, I wanna thank both uh, Nancy and Felicity. Excellent presentations. Um, 
you know, you, you both mentioned that bees need flowers. Um, and I, I know I'm biased, but I also think that people need flowers uh, just as, as much. Mrs. Johnson had a, a fairly famous quote that where flowers bloom, so does hope. And in a year that has thrown a lot at us, I'm, I'm really grateful that we have flowers um, and that we have bees as well. So thank you both for your time. Also wanna thank everyone for joining us today uh, for our Texas Science Festival talk on saving the bees. Um, and I'd like to thank Nancy and Felicity again for their time and acknowledge um, all of their efforts in these wonderful presentations. Please be sure to visit sciencefest.utexas.edu to sign up for more sessions between now and March 26th and contact CNSDEV, that's C-N-S-D-E-V, at austin.utexas.edu if you have follow-up from today's sessions. Thank you for your interest in Texas science, and we hope to see you virtually at another session soon.